Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening. If you would, get your Bibles out and open them up to Luke, the 17th chapter. Luke chapter 17, and no, you are not experiencing deja vu. I did ask you to open to Luke 17 this morning, and we want to work in Luke 17 tonight. We're going to work on the top uh, end of the chapter this evening as we look at some things here and an encounter that Jesus had with the disciples and some things that we can learn from that. Luke chapter 17, let's get those Bibles cranking. It is great to see everybody tonight, and it's great to be with you once again, to have the opportunity to worship uh, for this second time here on the Lord's Day. It's been a good day that God has given us, and I'm delighted to have the chance to be with you one more time to sing and to pray and to give and receive encouragement and to spend some time right now here in the Word of God. Let's immerse ourselves in the Word in Luke the 17th chapter. Let me just launch right in the middle of this episode here in Luke 17. Read with me, if you will, in verse 5. In Luke 17, and in verse 5, the apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Just stop right there. A couple of weeks ago, Hattie and I were downstairs in the basement and Hattie was playing with her toys, and I was organizing the closet under the stairwell, and I came across this puzzle that Tiffany and I had bought for Hattie several years ago. It was a children's puzzle of Noah and the ark. And two or three years ago, we attempted to sit down with Hattie and figure out how to put a puzzle together, but at the time, it was just, you know, it was just a little bit too much for Hattie at the age that she was and her development, and so she wasn't quite ready at that time and ended up being me and Tiffany mostly just putting it together. But Hattie's a big girl now. She's in school. She's developed some new skills and so forth, and so I pulled it out and I said, Hey, Hattie, do you want to put this puzzle together, this big Noah and the Ark puzzle? And she said, Yeah, let's do it. I said, all right, well, we tried to do this a couple years ago, but we're going to try it again. But this time, Daddy's not going to do all the work. Instead, you're going to do the work. I'm going to kind of coach you and give you some tips and some ideas along the way, but you're going to need to do the work. And she said, all right, I'm excited. Let's put this puzzle together. And so get all the pieces out, scatter them all out, turn them all over, get them right side up, and hey, here we go. We're ready to start putting the puzzle together. And Hattie grabs a couple of pieces, and well, she's trying to jam them together, even though they... They clearly don't fit together. And so I, all right, I got, let's, let's jump in here. Let's uh, offer some guidance here. Uh, hey, how about we work on the border? Do you see these pieces here that have a real straight edge on the side? Let's get all these pieces and put the border together. Those will be easy for us to put together. And so I grab a couple of border pieces and show her how that's done. Now you do the same. Well, Hattie grabs a border piece and then grabs a completely different piece, and she's trying to put those together. Okay, well, hold on. We're, we're, uh, 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 this isn't working here. Maybe my instructions aren't clear. I'm not doing the right thing. Well, then we start locating specific pieces on the puzzle in specific areas. Hey, here's pictures of the ark. You get those pieces and put those together. So she grabs a piece that looks like an ark and then... A piece over here that looks like an elephant, and she's trying to put those together. Okay, hold on, I'm still not coming through right. At that point, Hattie finally just had to say, Daddy, this is too hard. This is just too hard. We just can't do this. And I said, no, we can do this. It, I mean, come on, we, we can get this done. And so I start being a little bit more hands-on, and eventually we did get it done. We got the puzzle put together, and Hattie finally kind of developed a better understanding of how puzzles work and how all of that goes. But when, when it was all said and done, once she got done admiring the work, she then made it clear to me, she said, that was just hard. That was just too tough. To which I said, yes, it is. That's the reason it's called a puzzle. A puzzle is designed to be tough. It's designed to be challenging. And she said, well, I don't care. It's too tough. Well, you know what? Have you ever felt that way sometimes about the instructions and the directions that God gives you and I spiritually? You ever felt that way before? That sometimes God's commands and what God expects us to do, that it's... Sometimes it's just too difficult. That the obligations and the responsibilities that He places upon us as Christians, that, man, it's just tougher than I expected it to be. And maybe we even wonder to ourselves, how am I going to be able to do this stuff that God wants me to do when it just seems so hard? Have you ever felt that way? I know that I certainly have. There's been lots of times I've felt that way. Would it surprise you, though, to learn that there were occasions where the apostles felt that way? 
Indeed there were. There was at least one occasion, and we just read about it here in Luke chapter 17. The disciples of Jesus were given a very difficult command. We'll see in just a moment. It was a command about forgiveness. But their reply that we read there in verse 5 was, Lord, increase our faith. That is, Lord, what you've asked us to do is really, really hard. We're going to need some extra help if we're going to get that done. So increase our faith. Well, this evening, I'd like for us to look at this scene. I'd like for us to look at the whole context of it. Because I'd like for us to learn some really important yet hard truths about what we're supposed to do whenever obedience is hard. Whenever there are difficulties in what God expects of His children, how do we handle that? What should our attitude be about that? And I am presenting this lesson this evening for at least a couple of reasons. Number one... For anybody this evening who is not a Christian, but maybe you have entertained the possibility, you're considering it someday, I'd like to obey the gospel, I'm presenting this lesson for you because you need to know up front about the tough pathway that Christians travel and you need to count the cost as to whether or not you are willing to travel that path yourself. And then secondly, for those of us who already are Christians, I'm presenting this lesson because we need to be reminded of the tough path that we have chosen to travel lest we become complacent and lest we become weary and fail to reach the final destination along this journey. And so, let's just read this text and let's get it before us. And I want to set before us some important truths that Luke the 17th chapter teaches us. Read with me if you will, verses 1 through 10. In Luke 17 beginning in verse 1, the disciples said to Jesus, or excuse me, Jesus said to his disciples, "Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin." Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Verse 7, will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. There are five tough truths that I want us to consider from this tough passage. And these five truths, I'll go ahead and tell you, many of them are just flat out Harsh, at least harsh to our sensibilities. And they may be hard for us to accept and to swallow, but I want us to simply be willing to accept them on the basis of who it is that these truths are coming from. They are coming from the mouth of Jesus. And if ever there was anybody that we could trust to tell us hard things, and we are ready to accept those hard things, it's going to be Jesus And I want to look at those five truths this evening. The first of those, as we think about what it is that we're going to do whenever obedience is hard, we need to just start with the realization, number one, that the Lord has commanded us to do hard things. If you look here at the text, Jesus is instructing His disciples to do something that I think all of us would agree is extremely difficult. Verse 3, He talks about forgiving someone whenever they have done you wrong. And if you have ever been wronged before, if you have ever been cheated, if you have ever been lied to, if you've ever been taken advantage of or beaten up or laughed at or made fun of or cursed out, then you know full well it is really hard to forgive someone whenever they have mistreated you. 
You know, our natural reaction whenever someone hurts us is to retaliate and to get even or maybe to hold a grudge and to keep score. Forgiving people does not exactly come naturally to us. Many times it takes every ounce of strength that we can muster to even say the words, I forgive you. Many times we'll say it and we don't even mean it. But in verse 4, Jesus takes the hardness of that command and He amplifies it fourfold, fivefold, tenfold, a hundredfold. When He says there, if your trespasser does you wrong seven times in a day, that if he repents, you are to forgive him seven times over. Wow! Now that just got harder, didn't it? In fact, in another place, Jesus would tell Peter that if your brother sins against you and he comes to you and he seeks your forgiveness, you're to forgive him 70 times 7. Now there's not some, Jesus is not going for some kind of a numerical, mathematical equation where there's some kind of a limitation on how many times you extend forgiveness. No. The point he's trying to make in these passages is that whenever someone seeks your forgiveness, you're to give it to them. You are. You are to be forgiving. Doesn't matter how many times, you are to be ready to forgive. And that, that's tough. It is, that's really hard to do. And that is certainly not the only difficult thing that we find in the pages of the New Testament. Over and over again, we find the Lord calling upon His people to do hard things. For example, in Matthew 5 and in verse 44, Jesus says, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them who despitefully use you and persecute you. Are you kidding me? Not only do I got to forgive these people, but even people who would hate me, I need to return love to them and pray for them and do good for them. That, that's hard to do. Or what about Paul's construction in, verses, in Philippians chapter 2 and in verse 3 when he said we are to esteem others better than ourselves. That doesn't come naturally. Our natural inclination is to take care of me. But Paul says the biblical way is we esteem others more highly than ourselves. That is hard to do. Or what about the command that Jesus gives when He told the disciples to go and preach the gospel to the whole creation? Wow, there's a lot of people to try and teach the gospel to. Don't know if we're going to be able to get that done. Especially when you think about us today, the world in which we live. People are very resistant to the gospel. People don't want anything to do with religion. They don't want to hear what the Word of God says. And yet, the Great Commission must still go forth. Or what about in Matthew chapter 18 when Jesus says to go and tell a brother whenever he has sinned, tell his faults to his face. That's really difficult. That is awkward. That is painful. That is not an enjoyable and pleasant thing to do. Yet Jesus says, do it. Or what about what I would personally just deem to be the hardest command in all of the Bible and it is the command that's found again and again, the command to repent to turn away from sin and to turn to God and to bear fruits in keeping with repentance. That is so hard to do. And of course, that's, that's just the hem of the garment. The New Testament is littered with difficult and hard commands. And that's not even to mention the commands that might be harder for one individual than they might be for another individual. You think, for example, about the command to abstain from from drunkenness and rioting and that kind of behavior. That command might be really, really hard for the recovering alcoholic. But for a person who's never even touched the first drop of alcohol, well, that may not be hard at all. But the fact remains, the Lord expects us to do difficult things here upon this earth. And we need to understand that. That that is what separates the lost from the saved. That is what separates the unfaithful from the faithful. Do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 7? Step out of Luke for just a moment. In Matthew chapter 7, and in verses 13 and 14, Jesus talks here about doing what is difficult. In Matthew 7 and in verse 13, Jesus says, this is in the Sermon on the Mount, He says, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, verse 14, but the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Jesus says that most folks are taking the easy path in life. 
Most folks are going down the broad way. They're doing what feels good. They're doing what is the, the path of least resistance. They're enjoying sin. And they are traveling toward destruction. But the ones who are choosing to go down that difficult path, in the parallel account in Luke chapter 13, Jesus talks there about striving in agony to go through the difficult path. The straight and narrow way. Those people are on the pathway that leads to eternal life. And so yes, the Lord does ask us to do difficult things, but the reward at the end of that tunnel will be so worth it. We'll be glad that we were able to do those difficult things. But you know what? Even though the Lord does give us some difficult commands along life's way, that leads to this second truth from Luke 17, and that is that He does not give us permission to disobey those difficult commands. As you turn back to Luke chapter 17, after the disciples are told these hard things about forgiveness, Jesus then provides them a little illustration to show them that they are just as accountable for those hard commands as they are for all of the others. In verses 7, 8, and 9, Jesus describes a, a servant, kind of a hypothetical situation. What if there's a servant who's been working hard all day, he's been plowing and feeding his cattle and laboring in the fields, and then he comes inside and he's ready to eat supper and to rest and to enjoy his evening, but instead the master tells him, Hey, you still got some work to do. I need you to go and change your clothes and fix me some dinner and to serve me as I eat and drink. And Jesus says that that servant, yeah, he probably would have been tired and maybe was even a little bit grumpy from that hard day's work, but the master didn't let him opt out of his duties. The master did not give him a free pass on his chores for the day. No, the servant was required to serve his master until all the work was done. In fact, Jesus even says that that servant is going to serve the master without even so much as a thank you in return. And so as difficult as it must be for that servant to come in from the field and to have to wait hand and foot on the master, he does it anyway. Why? Because he recognizes that there is no other option. The master did not give him a license and an opportunity to disobey. The master does not give him a choice in that. The master simply says, this is what you're to do, and the servant's obligation is to do it. I think this is an important point that we sometimes neglect to fully acknowledge sometimes. I think sometimes we trick ourselves into believing that the Lord maybe will not hold us as accountable to those hard commands as He does to the easy ones. That the Lord will maybe somehow kind of grade on a curve. The Lord knows me and He knows how I am and so, so the Lord's going to kind of treat me a little bit differently than He will everybody else. Sometimes in our minds we sell out the gospel thinking, oh, you know, surely God won't be so strict about that forgiveness stuff as, as the preacher's making it sound or even as the text makes it sound. You know, surely God doesn't expect me to forgive my neighbor seven times in the same day when he repeatedly lets his dog come over and make a mess in my yard. Come on, he can't mean that. Surely God understands as well that it's just too much to ask of one person. So God, surely the Lord's going to, again, He's going to grade on the curve. He's going to be way more lenient than we think here. He's going to give me a free pass on that. Where's that in Luke 17? Where's that anywhere else in the New Testament? There's no indication that God's going to give freebies out. That God gives us permission to disobey or even to sometimes to do what we often do to practice situation ethics where, hey, it's okay to disobey here because I'm in this certain situation. You think, for instance, I'll give you the classic example of this. I just dealt with this this past week. Had a call here to the church building. Had a discussion about this with somebody. Think about when it comes to God's law on marriage and divorce and remarriage. The Lord has said in His Word that the only lawful grounds for divorce is for the cause of sexual immorality. Somebody says, well, but, but, but what if your husband is a bum? He just doesn't work, he's lazy, and he's just good for nothing. Well, what about that? Or what if somebody says, well, you know, what if your wife? What if your wife, she's spinning the family into financial ruin because of all of her, her purchases and buying and spending and getting all kinds of stuff. 
Or, you know, what if you just don't love your spouse anymore? You know, surely God understands just how difficult this particular relationship is. So surely God would make an allowance for me to put my spouse away so that I could be out of that hard situation and I can go over here and I can find somebody who loves me and I love them and we get along and we have a happy marriage and I can have the happiness that I'm looking for. Surely God would understand that. I'm going to say again, where, where, where's your verse? Where's a passage for that? God's law on marriage and divorce and remarriage, it's pretty clear. It's really not all that complicated. And God is not obligated to bend to our will just because that particular command is difficult. And why not? Because as John says in 1 John chapter 5 and in verse 3, in 1 John chapter 5 and in verse 3, John says that we keep His commandments... And His commandments are not burdensome. They're not. In other words, God's commands are not too difficult. God has not asked a single person in the history of humanity, His own Son included, to do anything that He or she could not accomplish. Persevering through a marriage that has problems? Yeah, that's difficult. But it can be done. Repenting of sin? Yeah, that's, that's really difficult. It is. It's hard. But it can be done. Forgiving someone seven times in a day? Yeah, that's really hard. It is. But it can be done. God's expectation is that we will obey His Word. Romans 12 verse 1 says that that is our reasonable Service. We have no excuse to disobey. Naturally though, somebody's going to say, okay, I, I, I get that, Josh. God does not give us permission to disobey. I understand about all that. But you know what? In order for me to obey those hard commands of the Lord, I, I'm going to need something extra. I'm going to need the Lord to give me some extra strength and some extra faith in order to obey those hard commands. And I should say something about that. In fact, Jesus wants to say something about that. Because Luke 17 teaches us thirdly that the Lord has already given us the strength that we need to obey those difficult commands. When you look at verse 5 once again, it's pretty clear the apostles thought that this command about forgiveness was too hard. They were just certain, hey, we're going to need some extra faith in order to do that. And so that's why they say, Lord, increase our faith. It seems as if they wanted the Lord to do something kind of extra special for them. I don't know. I don't know exactly what they were expecting Him to do on that occasion, but I want you to notice in verse 6 that Jesus does not perform some kind of a miracle. Jesus does not zap them with an extra helping of faith. Jesus does not offer to them right there on the spot some magic bullet three-point formula on how they can get more faith in the snap of a finger. No. In fact, Jesus doesn't even tell them that they need more faith. What Jesus tells them is that they need to use the faith that they already have. Jesus tells them that with even the faith the size of a teeny tiny mustard seed, that they could move a mighty mulberry tree from one place to another just by speaking the Word. Jesus says you don't need more faith. You don't need more strength. You just need to properly use what you've already got. And I think this is a powerful point. In fact, I'm afraid this is a point that maybe isn't taught enough. I think far too many Christians have become babies about their discipleship. I think far too often we become kind of sissified where we have this mindset that the apostles had, where we think that God's going to need to do something just extra for me. God's going to need to give me something extra special so that I can actually obey Him and do what He wants. Have you ever, for example, heard somebody talk about, about their temper? And they'll say things like, well, I'd, I'd like to do better. I would. I'd like to get a rain on my temper, but that's just the way that I am. I mean, I was born this way, and it's kind of in the genetics, and that's just the way I am. Or maybe you hear somebody who's maybe got difficulty with having lustful thoughts, or maybe they've even got an addiction to pornography, and they say things like, I, just, I, I can't help it. I can't, I'm just not strong enough to say no. Or maybe what happens sometimes is we, we observe a fellow Christian, and we say, man, look at brother so-and-so. 
If I just had the faith that he had, man, I mean, if God would give me that, I could really be something. Or, I mean, I wish I had sister so-and-so strength. If I had the strength that she had, then maybe I could overcome my sins too. If only God would do this. If only God would grant me that. I could obey those commands of the Lord and I'd be such a great Christian. Do you know what we're doing whenever we think that way? What we're doing is we're really just trying to dodge responsibility. We want to almost make it out like it's God's fault that we are weak. That somehow God did not do His part and that's why we are failing to render complete obedience to Him. Do you remember all the way back in the beginning with Adam? What did Adam say to God when God confronted him about his sin? Adam said, Lord, if you hadn't given me that woman... If you hadn't put me down here with her, if you hadn't kind of, you know, put me already kind of, you know, behind in the count from the start, then maybe, hey, maybe I'd overcome. It's God's fault, see? Really? It's never God's fault. And God most certainly, you need to understand, He has most certainly done His part to help us. He has. He has given us everything that we need to obey Him fully. Yes, even the difficult command. The question for you and I, though, is are we putting those things to use? Those spiritual blessings that we talked about this morning, are we using them? What about our faith? Are we putting our faith into practice? Because if we're not, then the truth is we don't have real faith. Because biblically speaking, real faith is a faith that acts, and a faith that does not act is not a faith at all. I'm reminded of what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Would you find 2 Corinthians 12? Step out of Luke again. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12... Paul was experiencing some real difficulty in his life. He has this thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was, but whatever it was, it was really causing him problems. So much so that on three separate occasions, he asked the Lord, Lord, help me. Help me, Lord. I'm asking for your assistance here. Remove the thorn from me. Do you remember what Jesus' response was? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm looking here in verse 9, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Jesus says, Paul, I've already given you all you need. You've been given the grace and all the tools and all the resources that you need to survive and to thrive and to be what I want you to be as my disciple. And the same goes for you and I. Whatever difficulty, whatever difficult commands that we might be confronted with by the Lord, we need to understand that this, well, that this is the same for us as it was for those disciples long ago. And that is that God has already supplied us with the strength that we need to move forward in faithful service unto Him. And I want to be clear, and I say this almost at the risk of weakening this point, but I'm going to say it anyway. This certainly does not mean that you should never pray for 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 more faith, or that you should never try to grow, or that we should not try to be more than what we are right now in Christ. That's a very biblical idea. We should. But what the Lord says in Luke 17, what the Lord says in 2 Corinthians 12, is that He has given us what we need in order to do the things that He wants us to do. And we need to seize upon those resources And we need to simply live for Him and we need to fulfill our duty. And I use the word duty intentionally here because that leads to this fourth truth from Luke 17. And that is that Jesus wants us to develop a strong sense of duty. If you'll notice again in verses 7 through 10, there's a lot of emphasis, I believe, on this idea of service, this idea of duty. In verse 7, Jesus says there was a servant. And he was plowing and feeding cattle. Verse 8, he was making dinner ready. He was to serve his master. Verse 10, the word servant pops up once more. And then we see that word duty. I think Jesus is trying to make a not so subtle point here. Jesus is showing us that we need to have a sense of duty toward the Lord and toward his commands. We need to remember that we are. We're the servant. We're the servant in this relationship. And that means that the job of the servant is to devote his or her life to carrying out the will of the Master. That's our job. That is our job as Christians. I'm always impressed with just how many times the Apostle Paul, in his writings, in the introduction of his writings, he will identify himself as a servant. Romans 1 verse 1, Paul a servant of Jesus Christ. 
Galatians 1 verse 10, Paul, the servant of Christ. Philippians 1 verse 1, Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ. Titus 1 verse 1, Paul, a servant of God. If you've ever found yourself wondering, man, how was Paul able to do the stuff he did? How was he able to accomplish so much in the kingdom of Christ? How was he able to obey all those hard and difficult commands? Well, do you think maybe it was because he had this sense of duty firmly implanted and embedded in his heart? I think that has a lot to do with it. I think Paul realized that being a Christian is not about me. We read that verse this morning, Galatians 2 verse 20. I'm crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. It's about the Lord. And this sense of duty, this sense of servanthood, I am afraid it is sorely lacking in our world today. Isn't that so? Why, why do you think so many marriages fall apart these days? I think if you drill down to the bottom, the core issue, it's because too many husbands and too many wives do not have a sense of duty toward their spouse. Why do you think so many employers find it just trouble and difficult to find good help in the workplace? Well, I believe it's because too many employees, they do not have a sense of duty to their employer and to their company. Why do you think so many churches, so many congregations are floundering and dying off these days? And please don't say, oh, i tell you what, it's COVID-19 and all the troubles that it's brought. No, that's not it. The problem is too many Christians don't have a sense of duty toward Christ and toward the bride of Christ, the church, their brothers and sisters in Christ. Duty is a much forgotten concept in our world. And I've got to tell you, I'm afraid that too many times we as Christians, we make Christian duty more difficult than it ever was intended to be because we just don't have the sense of duty that we should. It's kind of like the guy who's, who's always looking for uh, just a, a job with the least amount of work. He's a lazy person. He's looking for the least amount of work with the most amount of pay. And the moment that he takes a job that requires of him to do just the slightest bit of effort, to lift his finger and to do anything, oh, it's the worst thing in the world. Can you believe they asked me to do that? I can't believe they expect me to get that done. I think that's sometimes how we are as Christians. We make God's commands more difficult, more burdensome than they really are because we're not being consistent about duty. Maybe the problem is, is we've treated Christianity more like a hobby. We've not treated it like it is our job, like it is our life, like it is our duty. No, we've treated it like a hobby. It's a thing that we do on the weekends. Maybe what we need here is we need some of Ecclesiastes 12 verse 13. You know that verse, don't you? David Hatfield knows that verse. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. And notice commandments there is just kind of broad, just commandments. That includes even the hard ones. Keep His commandments. Why? For this is the whole duty of man. Our duty in life is to serve the Lord regardless of whether we like that or not, regardless of whether we agree with that or not, regardless of what's in it for us or not, it is not going to always be convenient. And it's not always going to be easy. But our God has provided a way, the way, for us to be saved from sin, for us to spend eternity in His presence, and for that, we should love Him and fear Him and give Him the service of our life in everlasting gratitude and thanksgiving. And I believe a strong sense of duty can go a long way in rendering our obedience to Him. And can I just say right here, just kind of as a, an extra side point, this is not to say that obedience is what it's all about and there's nothing else but obedience. If you listen to this morning's sermon at all, I hope you understood that the motivation behind our obedience that there needs to be a love and there needs to be gratitude behind that obedience, that that is what makes obedience work. But at the end of the day, when the love and the gratitude are there, that needs to lead to obedience. We must obey the Lord. That is of paramount understanding. Which brings me finally to Luke the 17th chapter. Because as we look at these tough truths that this chapter explains to us about the difficulty of hard commands and how do we deal with all of that, what Luke 17 teaches us is that when we finally do rise to the occasion 
and we fulfill our duty? Lastly, we must not commend ourselves for completing those difficult commands and completing our duty. If you'll notice verse 10 once again, Jesus says, even when you have done everything that the Lord has commanded you to do, all you can say for yourself is that I've done my duty. I simply did what I was supposed to do. That is the best that you and I will ever be able to say for ourselves when it's all said and done. That means then, practically speaking, that means that there is no room for me to congratulate myself. There is no room for me to think that somehow I am special or that maybe I am better than other Christians. Hey, look what I did and they couldn't do that, but I was able to do that. No. Or that somehow people ought to look up to me now. Oh, that I'm just the sterling example of what it means to complete Christian duty. Or to think that I'm such a great servant that God ought to, well, God ought to give me a gold star as being the Christian of the week. No. No, Jesus says that even after you and I have done all of our duty, we are still simply unprofitable or unworthy servants. And that is just so, isn't it? I, I am not worthy to even be considered a servant of the Almighty Creator of the universe. It blows my mind that, that, that I even can be an unworthy servant. But the fact that the Lord does make it possible for me to be an unworthy servant, I ought to be thankful that God would allow me to even have such a meager position in His kingdom, to even be a doorkeeper in the house of God. That if I forgive my neighbor seven times, seven hundred times in a day, well, so what? I simply did what the Lord told me to do. I don't have room to boast about that. I don't have room to pat myself on the back for that. Nor should I expect anybody else to commend me. Oh boy, you are an awesome Christian here. I completed those tough commands. Hey, everybody look up to me. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 18, the one who seeks to commend himself is not approved. But guess what? The one who is simply seeking the Lord's commendation, that person is approved. God will commend us. We certainly don't deserve it. And we absolutely cannot earn it. But if we will persist in simply doing the Lord's will, all the way from now until we reach the end of life's way. Matthew 25 verse 20 tells us that there's coming a day when the Lord will look at us and He will say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And those are the words that I desperately want to hear. And the only way that I'm going to get to hear those wonderful words spoken to me is if I quit my whining about how tough the Lord's commands are, if I'll quit complaining about, oh, I need more strength to get this done. What I need to do is I need to simply perform my duty to the Lord who loves me so much. God wants our obedience. He doesn't want our excuses. He doesn't want our explanations. He doesn't want to hear, oh, how hard this is, how difficult this is to do that. No, what God wants is He wants us to simply give Him our best. And I believe that when we do that, these tough commands that we encounter along the way, we'll come to find out that they're not as tough as they look on the paper. In fact, what we'll be able to say is what Paul said in Philippians 4 and verse 13, that I can. I can do all things. I can even obey those hard commands. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let's go to God in prayer about that. Would you pray with me, please? Our dear gracious God and our Father in heaven, Father, we come before you this evening confessing to you that all too often, Lord, we act like babies and we complain and we moan about the things that you have asked us to do. And Father, we fail to consider that what you have asked us to do is so minimal and is so small in comparison to the glories and the greatness of of what you have extended to us through Jesus Christ, your Son. Father, forgive us for when we are weak and when we complain and when we act as if we cannot do what you have asked us to do. Father, help us to understand and to recognize that the grace and the mercy and the strength that you have already extended to us, that it is more than enough. 
for us to do the things that you want us to do. Father, forgive us when we fall short in those areas. Help us, Father, to, 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 to lean upon you more fully. Help us, Father, to seek the strength that is found only in Christ Jesus. Father, we pray that you would help us each and every day. There are difficult things that we encounter along life's way. All of us experience difficult things and different things from one another. Help each one of us in our particular circumstances. Help us to serve you faithfully to the very end. We want so much to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. And we ask for your guidance and your direction all along life's way. We thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for his teaching here in Luke the 17th chapter and how it helps us and it fortifies us. We're thankful for His life and for His reign and how He advocates and assists us even right now at Your right hand. And it is in His name that we offer this prayer. And amen.